Are we a go? Hi, Shelby. I'm so excited that you're introducing this program this evening. As we let people into the room, we're up to, you know, about 30 people who are jumping in and we're gonna give them just another minute until we can get people in the room. And then we'll go ahead and ask you to introduce yourself. Okay, for, we're, for a better viewing experience, we recommend um, everyone use our gallery view so that you can see all of our panelists. And if I can, let's introduce Ms. Shelby Carmen. Is going. <laughs> Ms. Shelby Carmen. Thank you, Christy. Good evening. My name is Shelby Carmen. I'm the office manager for the Center for Student Engagement at Frederick Community College. I have the pleasure to welcome you this evening to one of our call to action justice series entitled From Thought to Action, Taking it to the Street. Tonight, we have three outstanding student advocates, activists, excuse me. Those students helped organize the March for Justice in Frederick, a response to the murder of George Floyd and other acts of police which was set <laughs> at rallied over 5,000 participants in a peaceful, nonviolent protest. The other student was an outstanding student leader at Frederick Community College and continues his work in the service to the community. Also facilitating with me this evening are faculty members, Professor Ann Hoffman, Associate Professor of English, Professor Laura Cordova, Professor, Associate Professor of World Languages. Now I'd just like to introduce a small blurb to, about the panelists. Akia Bellops, a Frederick native, a wife, a mother of three. She works for the Department of Defense. She is also a lead consultant with Vital Consulting Solutions. Akia has embarked on a journey that seeks racial and social justice and is committed to seeking equitable changes that are long overdue for the Black community. Akia continues to pursue her degree in business administration with a desire to obtain her master's degree in psychology. Avante Duckett, a proud life res long resident of Frederick Community. He graduated from Frederick Community College in 2015. While at FCC, Cavante served as president of the Student Government Association, chaired on the Maryland Higher Education Student Advisory, Advisory I'm sorry, excuse me advisory board and student representative on the presidential search committee. Devante has been employed with Jer Gary L. Rollins Funeral Home since 2011 and currently is the director of the Al Allen P. Linton Jr. Emergency Shelter. Devante has a heart for the community, a mind for progress and being a voice for the next generation of leaders. He lives by the motto, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Elijah G. She is a daughter, a friend, team, a team member, and better yet, an activist. Elijah graduated from Frederick Community College in 2018 in general studies. 
She obtained her bachelor's degree in communications with a major, a minor, I'm sorry, in broadcasting journalism from Bowie State University. Elijah currently works at Hillcrest Elementary School. Elijah says her goal is to empower the next generation so that they know there is no age limit to bravery, assertiveness, or power. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to my co-facilitators, Professor Laura Cordova and Professor Ann Hoffman. Hello, good evening. I'm so honored and thrilled to be here tonight with these amazing student activists, amazing young activists. Um, I teach Spanish and classes and cultural studies of Latin America here at FJC. And I'm really excited to hear what these panelists have to say. So let's get started. The first question I have is for Cavanti. Cavanti, what inspired you to become an activist? Can you all hear me? Yes, we right, can. Yes. All right, uh, first off, thank you, um, Professor Ann, for the, uh, for the question. To the entire uh, FCC family, thank you all for um, the invitation to, to come back home. It's been a while, um, but it's always good to see your faces. Uh, what inspired me to become an activist? You know, I've, I've always been the one, um, you know, willing to stand up and speak out, uh, even from a young age. And so, you know, I've always been told I have an old spirit, um, you know, born leader, all those great things. And so anytime I saw something wrong, um, I felt it was my duty, even when I was wrong, um, to, to, to say something. Um, and so, it, and to build on that, in high school, I went to Tuscarora High School, uh, participated in the uh, Necktie Club, um, which really gave me the, the foundation and the leadership skills um, to uh, communicate and build networks with, with, with folks at, F, at Tuscarora and within the Necktie Club. Um, and so the Necktie Club was in, I think, four or five of the high schools at the time, sponsored by Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity, uh, led by Mr. Earl Robbins. Um, you know, Mr. Robbins took us on a number of trips to HBCUs. Um, he just opened our eyes to, to a lot of uh, things that we uh, potentially would not have seen. Um, for those that don't know, the Necktie Club, is the, it's really dressed for success to some extent. Um, young uh, Black men uh, who wear ties to school. Um, sort of unheard of almost, um, but it was always a great opportunity. Uh, we, the majority of us couldn't wait until club day to put on our, our suit and tie. And it, it sort of gave us a, a sense of pride while walking down the, down the hallways. And so um, I, I would really have to say the Necktie Club is where um, I, I got the, the backing and the support uh, to want to step up and be a leader um, in, in my community. Oh, thank you for that answer. Thank you, that's very interesting, very inspiring. Elijah or Akia, would you guys, would any of you like to answer that question? Of what inspired you to become an activist? Um, I'll go ahead, thank you for um, the question. I would say for me, that was a challenging question to answer because um, I think it took me a while to see myself as an activist. Um, I can piggyback with what Cavante said. I usually found myself in situations where I was advocating. Um, I would say that my mom, my parents probably say, would say that from a young age. So I would say from a young age, my voice probably got me into more trouble than I wanted to. And I say that because it's important to recognize that a lot of times young people are speaking out and they're doing things or acting out. And sometimes we can crush the very personality and the gifts and the talents in young people. Um, I remember my mom always saying, well, you should be a lawyer because you're very not argumentative as to argue, but you get your point across or you make a good statement. And so I would say from a very young age, it, it probably was birth within me. But after the George Floyd incident, there was no other there was nothing else that I could do other than say that at this point, I, I, I desire, I feel like it is my duty to say something. Um, 
even saying it like that moment in time was just surreal for the situation like our country went through and watched that and we all grieved collectively and the expression of that was what took place in June and Frederick and the beauty and the the spirit of that that came about was it was breathtaking. So since then, I continue to to walk in that and and to advocate for those that haven't quite found their voice yet, while still being an example of how to do it, how to do it nonviolently, how to do it in a way that is with humility and dignity and respectfully, and teaching the young people to model that behavior as well. Wow, thank you for those thoughts. Thank you so much. So for the next question, I will hand it, hand it over to Professor Hoffman. Good evening, everyone. I just wanna say what an honor it is to be here tonight with um, you three. I uh, was lucky enough to march this summer along with you all. And I remember being in that crowd, feeling that energy. And I was like, I wanna know those people. I know some of them are FCC people and I wanna know them. And so I just feel, um, a little bit like a schoolgirl today being able to chat with you about your experiences and just to learn a little bit from you about how you did it how you pulled this off um you know frederick's not always an easy place to pull off this kind of work um and and just the power of that experience, the power of the march for people listening who weren't there um it, it was something to behold over five thousand people am i right right? Um, it was incredible. So my question um, is for Akia. Um, and actually, I know, Elijah, you didn't get a, a chance to respond to the last question. So if you'd prefer to go first, that's fine. But, uh, but Akia, I think you were uh, kind of queued up to speak first on this question, which is, what does it take to move this passion, right? Like this idea forward into action. And I teach a lot of, I teach English classes and I'll, we talk a lot about race and gender and different experiences of, of class, right? And so we have a lot of, we talk about it a lot at the college, but then how do you move it forward into action? So Aki, I'm gonna start with you and then Elijah, you're on deck to respond to that as well, if that's okay. All right. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I would say that it takes a, uh, a heart and a passion like you have to want to do it. Um, the work that we do, a lot of times people, they do look at it and go, it's admirable, but they don't realize the, the emotional tax, the mental tax um, and the strain that it takes to actually do this work, to do this work while being black. Um, one, we're impacted because we experience it. And then two, when you're advocating for it, it's like experiencing it to the hundredth power for people, like you're carrying that weight for someone else or you're raising your voice so that someone else doesn't feel the direct impact of it. Um, and then I would say with courage. And for me, courage is not the absence of fear. A lot of people will go, oh, you're fearless. And absolutely not. I'm very transparent with uh, fear. Um, I was sharing on before we started about my speech class that I took at FCC. And I remember having labs four, four times on a Saturday and I had to record myself doing different speeches. And I remember yelling at my kids and my husband not to interrupt me because I was embarrassed. Don't walk in, I had to have the room to myself. Um, marching in the street in June, standing up in front of 5,000 plus people standing up in front of five, um, I would still have fear. The, am I gonna say something wrong? Um, also in this fight, is there gonna be violence? Who else is here? I know that we're coming to be nonviolent and peaceful and we wanna seek reform and change, but there's other people here that view us um, and hate us. They hate us for the color of our skin. They hate us for what we're standing up for. They hate us for the change that we're trying to bring. So I would say it does take courage and a willpower. Um, outside of that, it, it does take some organiz organization and some other skills, the leadership skills. Kavante mentioned it. I think sometimes people think that you can just get up and do this. And it does take a level of leadership, the ability to lead. 
because this is a crowd. When we're um, doing demonstrations, this is a crowd that we don't know. This isn't work, it's not school. How, how are you going to be able to one, control your group and your team while also um, influencing this crowd to stay within a controllable manner? Um, those are things. So working well with teams, there's some skill sets that I think within the workforce that can also, I definitely use my workforce experience, leading teams, managing people, conflict resolution, de-escalation, I use all of those skills whenever I do anything within demonstrating or advocating. So I bring my whole self. I bring what I learned at FCC. I bring uh, 20 years within corporate and also working within nonprofit. And I bring myself as a mom and a wife and a daughter. I bring my whole self there because I don't know who I'm going to encounter. I don't know what piece of me they'll need to get that day. It could be the strong disciplinary, I'm advocating for someone else, or it could be the soft, someone's been broken and hurt and I need to be able to reach them in a place that me yelling could intimidate them. So I would say you would really need to look within yourself. And when you do, recognize that this road, you're gonna discover pieces of you that you thought were healed or resolved or you didn't even know was there. So the journey will cause you to discover and rediscover um, things even within yourself. And I will always, I'll leave it with saying, be forgiving of yourself. <laughs> I hope everybody else attests, there are moments to where the atmosphere will get the best of you. It can be charged and you can lose it or you can say things or you can have a bad moment be forgiving of yourself this journey the foundation is built off of forgiveness and unity so we have to also accept that as we take the journey to advocate and lead and and that's something that I had to learn it's not something that I'm I master even as I speak of it right now thank you Akia wow what a a lot to chew on here. Two things stand out to me. Uh, number one, the risk that this work um, requires that you take on when you do this work. You're visible in ways that you, uh, especially the roles that you've played, right, in standing in front of crowds. And we'll talk a little bit later about ways that people can participate and maybe not be quite so visible, but still the visibility. And then also, these things don't just happen. I think sometimes there's this mythology that like, People just get out in the streets and they march. This is an event. This requires a tremendous amount of intention and organization and corporate skills that you just spoke to. So thank you for speaking to that because that's a myth about activism, right? That it just happens. It doesn't, it takes leaders and a lot of unpaid work. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that, right? So, so um, I'll get off of my soapbox now, but thank you for, for your, your comment. And Elijah, I'm gonna um, hand it over to you to answer the question, what does it take to move thought to action? And are there any skills or resources that you think um, are kind of required or have made it um, a little easier for you to do this work? Um, well, since this is my first time speaking, um, hello, thank you to ev um, everyone who put this together. It's an amazing opportunity. Um, to all the viewers, hello, and we hope that you grasp, grasp some of this information and take it with you. Um, when I think about what it takes, um, I think it takes bravery. Um, I think it takes confidence, empathy, um, all of those things. It's a mixture. It's like a giant bowl full of emotions. It takes a lot of skills. And to speak on the march specifically, it's so funny um, that we always say it takes so much organization because when I say we put that march together in a week, I, I cannot lie to you. It was done in a week and it was very stressful. There were hot moments within our organization um, that, you know, we thought, you know what, <laughs> we can't do this. We just absolutely can't do this, but you have to have confidence, right? You have to be able to say, you know what, let me get up here and say what's right to say the uncomfortable, the uncomfortable thing that nobody else wants to say, right? Because it's the things that we don't want to say that need to be said. 
And in order to enact that change, we have to say those things. And I, I, I encourage more people, especially who are in their 20s, to get out and have those uncomfortable conversations because it takes that. It genuinely takes that in order to make sure that the next generation and the future, our future children literally have a better environment, a better government, a better systemic um, system, a better prison. You know, it takes those things. It takes us having those uncomfortable conversations in order to enact those change. And if we don't have the conversation, then who will? So, um, you know, I encourage a lot of people, especially in the early 20s at FCC, step out of your comfort zone and, and take that step off of the ledge. Just do it. And there's no promise that you're going to be successful at it, but you can look back and say that you did it, right? right? And you can check that off of the box. So I'll, I'll say that it takes confidence. It also takes grit. It's not an easy job. You know, you'll run into people who, who, who don't, who are opposed to your views, but you have to learn to communicate with those people. And you have to learn that not everybody's going to have the same view or opinion as you. And you take that and you swallow that hard pill, but you find a different avenue and you find a different way to reach that person, that person specifically in their opinion. So there's multiple ways to reach people, but you know, it takes grit, bravery, empathy. It, it takes a lot. Love it. Thank you, Elijah. What a thoughtful and awesome answer. I, I, something that you said in the midst of your, com your, uh, your comment was um, about not everything being easy, right? Like, and we went, it was, it was a week, you did it, you organized it in a short amount of time because you know, I mean, also marches have to be, they have to be timely. You can't like plan for three months, right? If you're trying to respond to something that just happened. So you've got to do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. And so Kavante, I'm curious um, what you think about, if you could answer this question of what was sort of the hardest part of organizing this march, right? So there's the skills that are required, but then like, what was hard about organizing that and um, how maybe how did you draw on some of those resources and experiences, leadership experiences that you had to manage that? So speaking to Elijah's point, I, I really think it's a willingness to, to speak up. Um, once you know that you have the voice and you use that voice, um, I think people will follow. Uh, Malcolm X once said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes. And so it's really for me, um, why, while while I wasn't um, an active participant in the March for Justice, I was present, didn't have an active role, um, but did support them. Um, you know, it, it's always been um, showing up no matter what. Um, you know, prior to uh, the March for Justice, we led a week long protest on the square corner. Um, we were out there every single day. Um, and so, and I'm always the, you know, I'm the grassroots guy, go with the flow, call me, I'll show up. Um, I, I've never been a big, to be honest, I've never been a big planner. It just, it just happens. I'm a, uh, uh, you know, I just go with the flow sometimes. Um, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing, but um, I, I think it's, it's a necessary um, trait or necessary skill. Um, you know, following the, the, the March for Justice, um, we led a group down to I-70. Um, never in my life did I think I would march on a highway. Um, but you know, the, the, the young people had the energy, um, they said, we're going to 70. I said, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure that the highway is where we're supposed to be marching. Um, they said, we're going with or without you. And so I really had a decision to make. It's either, um, do I leave this group behind or do I keep going with them? Um, and so I decided to, to keep going with them because if something happened, the reality of the situation is, well, Cavante was there and then all of a sudden he disappeared. And so um, I knew I had a, 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 a commitment and duty to, to the young people that were following behind us. Um, uh, but again, it, it really takes the willingness. Um, it's the willingness to serve and the willingness to speak up um, when, when called upon. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to my amazing colleague, Professor Cordova. She has the next set of questions. Okay. Um, this question will be directed towards Akia. Um, Akia, what would you say, how did FCC prepare you to do this work? Were there classes or other experiences that helped you develop your desire to lead and to advocate for social change? I will say, um, 
FCC definitely helped me prepare for the work. So if I could give a backdrop, um, I'm born and raised from Frederick, but grew up in Urbana. And the time that I grew up in Urbana was not very diverse. Um, I was maybe one of two black girls in my class. And I dealt with a lot of racism and discrimination on that side of Frederick County growing up in Urbana. I remember the only one liquor store out there um, to go get bread or milk, Frank's Liquor was out there. And I remember growing up being a little girl and the man behind the counter never put my mom's money in her hand she would hand it to him and he always put it on the counter. And I'm, I remember asking her why, what, why is he doing that? And she was, she was uh, adamant about saying, I gave it to you in your hand, you give it to me in my hand. And so I grew up with these experiences, being a Girl Scout and then the Brownie and going to school and all the girls had went to a sleepover and I was the only black girl and my mom having to tell me why the excuse. So these encounters would shape my mindset over the years. And I did not necessarily have a strong love for my town because I didn't understand why something that I couldn't change wasn't acceptable, why, why I wasn't accepted by those that didn't look like me. Um, so growing up, I went to Urbana and I went to CTC, which was next to a Frederick Community College. And that was my introduction because I had to take um, biology and several other classes at CTC. And then I was introduced to a medical terminology class at FCC. And until that moment, I counted myself out, I believe, forever going or advancing my education. So fast forward briefly, at 17, um, I had become pregnant. Um, well, I got pregnant at 16 and had my baby at 17. And then that was just like, all right, this is it. This is the plan for your life. Me and my husband are about to celebrate 21 years together. But at the time, I did not know if that was going to be the path for my life. So I just knew I had to work and I don't have time for school. So I really counted myself out. It took for, and I want to stress the importance that from walking in to sit down and talk to a counselor, a counselor that ended up knowing my last name was Hall and kept me in there for about two hours. She really encouraged me from the get-go. I went to sign up, but I don't think I would have went. So that first initial meeting was what got me because when you have people that look like me and have experienced things that come into Frederick Community College, just because they signed up and they're accepting classes does not mean that they'll make it to that first class for whatever reason. So I commend everyone on this call because the work, it, it just circles back with being able to produce who I am today. Fast forwarding to the communications class and walking the halls and seeing Miss Shelby, there was always someone there that was encouraging along the way. Maybe you didn't realize that I had, by the time I went to FCC, I had three children at home and had been married for six years and was five years into a career. So I was balancing uh, multiple different um, hats. And if I had a rough day, there was somebody there that was encouraging me. If I walked on that campus and was tired, um, there, was, there was a class there that gave me the extra energy that I needed. That is what helped me continue in my career. It helped me continue to go for certifications while I was still pursuing my degree. Um, I feel like it shaped and molded the leader in me because that was my first step. In the career world, I wasn't a leader at that time. I was a worker. I wasn't managing teams. I was just going to work, trying to get by with my family. But that step of signing up for FCC, I saw myself different. So I don't think, I'm, I'm here to speak to the one that doesn't realize like the one that counted themselves out, didn't see themselves as such a leader. That was me. And that's why I like to be very transparent because I didn't see myself in a million years sitting here talking to people and other people for FCC because I never saw myself going to that class. But it was the infrastructure that you guys have in place that supported me through my fears, through my doubts, through my insecurities, and got me to this point. 
that I'm sitting here before you today. So it, it was beautiful. I can't, hopefully that answered the question, but it kind of like wraps it all up into who I am today. Yes, it did, Akia. Thank you. And look at you now. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Kabanti, I know you spoke to us about your high school experiences in the, in the necktie club. Could you say a few words about your experience at, the, at FCC? It might take me the whole hour, um, but, uh, you know, FCC created a lot of opportunities for me, like really. Um, when I graduated from high school, I did not even, um, you know, they say community college, it's a, it's a commuter um, college. You know, you don't want to go and get involved and do all these things. Um, uh, but when I got to FCC, I first participated in PASS with the Multicultural Student Services. Um, and I think it was Pathways to Achieving Student Success or something like that, if I, I could be wrong. I think that was the acronym, but um, it got involved with PASS, uh, MSS, um, hats off to, uh, at the time, Director Chad Adero, um, and uh, now Persis Johnson, she was Persis Bates then, but you know, hats off to MSS. They really opened my eyes to a new level of of experiences of emotions, especially. Um, and so from there, uh, there was a, the SGA election had, had already happened prior to me um, getting to FCC in 2012. Um, and for some odd reason, whoever was the vice president of administration decided, decided to resign. Uh, so uh, Melissa Main, they hosted um, interviews and I was like, man, I'm a first year student here. I'm gonna go ahead and apply. Um, unbeknownst to me, um, there was really a, a week left to, to apply for this position. Um, applied, interviewed, got the position. Um, while I was the president uh, or the, the vice president of administration, this was at the same time, and Jeannie, forgive me if I'm not supposed to speak on this one, but this was at the same time that uh, President F.J. Talley um, was hired. Um, and within months, you know, the, the college parted ways. Um, as a student, you know, we were, we were struck because it was just like the president's gone. No one knows what happened. Um, we weren't told anything. Um, so uh, myself and the, the board at, for our SGA, we went and talked to the board of trustees. Um, we, uh, started a petition to figure out, you know, why aren't you all telling us anything about, uh, what, what took place? Um, later, uh, the uh, sitting president, Doug Browning, came to our SGA meeting along with uh, board trustee president Dixie Miller. Um, they came and spoke to us and they told us, you know, this is this is what it is. And there's really nothing, um, you know, we can tell you all. And, I, and I'll never forget it. Dixie Miller, uh, she said, um, I said, well, the students deserve to know what happened to the president. And Dixie Miller looked at me and said, well, uh, people in hell want ice water. And I, I will never forget that. And we actually laughed about it after the fact. But at the time, I was like, hold on, did she really just come out of her mouth and say it to me? But, you know, and so we, 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 we went back and forth. Um, again, that pushed the students to want uh, more change. And so we continued to push, we continued to push, we continued to push. Um, of course, you know, we didn't get the answers we were looking for. But uh, following that, I then served, uh, did work study through MSS, again, participating. Um, they ran a big six and elite eight program. Uh, they really focused on uh, development of men and women. Uh, Big Six was primarily for, for men. Elite Eight was for uh, women. They taught us about um, our, our history dating back to slavery. Uh, Chad showed us some very vivid uh, videos. They really made you sit and think um, a, about your future and what you want to do and the impact that you can have um, as an as a African-American male and female. Um, later, I served as the president of the Student Government Association. And during that time, uh, I had the opportunity to serve on the uh, presidential search committee, which hired the, the current sitting president. Um, and, and I tell you, a lot of these, you know, I, I attended the board of trustee meetings on behalf of the um, uh, SGA. Uh, you know, I did um, the president's cabinet and all these things. And the majority of the time, I was one of few uh, black men in the room. Um, and so, you know, really pushed me and motivated me to try to get more uh, students who looked like me involved. Um, so there are some of the things that, that, that FC, FCC did. And, and like I said, FCC opened up my mind to a, to a new world. And so I would encourage anyone who is considering um, community college that this should be your first step before going to a four-year university. Um, you know, 
for me, FCC has always been home. It was always welcome. It was always comfortable. Uh, even when I go back to, well, can't go back now because of COVID, but when I do go through the halls, you know, I always see someone or, um, you know, Miss Shelby always pulls me in her office. Uh, uh, you know, MSS is still home. Uh, Shianti Blackman, I see she's on online watching. So shout out to, to my MSS family. Um, but like I said, FCC opened so many, so many doors for me. Uh, you know, Jeannie used to take us to Annapolis for Student Advocacy Day. I mean, the list goes on. Um, and so it really prepared me uh, to, for some of the current things I do today. Um, in 2018, I ran for the county council, uh, which was, you know, because of F FCC gave me the, the leadership ability to, to do these things. And now um, I always tell people when the George Floyd incident happened, um, you know, I felt that I had to speak out on behalf of my community, young African-American folks. Um, but at the same time, you know, COVID was, was coming, you know, COVID was here. And so in my day job, I work at the emergency shelter. So I deal with the homeless population and, and the governor put, a, uh, put something in place called a shelter in place order. So, you know, my community, my clients don't have a place to, to shelter in place. And so at the time I'm advocating on behalf of, so I've always find myself advocating on behalf of the most vulnerable folks in our population, whether it be people of color, whether it be those disenfranchised, whether it be young people. Um, so thank you to everyone at FCC who played a vital role um, in, in, in my continued success. Wow, thank you, Kabanti. Oh, that is amazing. You just you took full advantage of all the opportunities that FCC had to offer. FCC is so proud of you. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Professor Hoffman to see if she has any other questions. And I think you're on mute. Thank you. You'd think after all this Zoom time that I would have that down, but here we are. Okay, so thank you. Um, Professor Cordova for handing it over to me. I, um, I do have one, one more question and uh, this has been such a rich discussion. I, I also wanna allow time at the end for um, our audience to ask some, question, ask some questions of our panelists. But this question is for Elijah. Um, I, I know that a lot of students that I speak to, they, they say that they don't know how to get involved. Either they don't feel like they are political Right? Like, I don't like politics. I'm not political. Right. Or, and I kind of feel like that's a little bit of a code for um, either they're not informed or they're not, um, they don't know how to get involved and they are a little bit afraid of how to get involved. Um, what would you say to your fellow classmates, um, friends? What advice would you give to them about how to get started in being an activist? Right. So great question. Um, this question comes up a lot um, just because I think it sometimes can be overwhelming with the amount of opportunities that, you know, organizations, schools uh, that they offer. But there are three things that I can definitely um, advice wise that I can tell you in order, in order to get involved. One, networking, something I did not take advantage of, full advantage of when I was at FCC now. Um, like Cavante said, I was introduced to the multicultural office through Cavante to Miss P, um, and who is now run by Miss Yanti Blackman. And through that office, I was able to speak on different panelists. Um, I also was able to join Big um, Big Six and Elite Eight. Um, I was able to. Um, I was a part of the basketball team, the lacrosse team. I was a captain for both of those. So throughout FCC, I took on different opportunities. And I was able to network through that. So I think sometimes there's this misconception that you have to network with political people. And that's not true at all. So to all my peers that are listening, let me tell you firsthand that the march that we did in June, took, it took place, it started with Gabe, Gabriel Moore. He actually went to FCC and he's about 19 years old. So, and he has no political background at all. And it just took some typing of the thumbs on social media and just doing what you had to do. So network, get in touch with people. If you're listening today, here are three activists really willing, willing to help you if you have a question on how to get involved. 
Facebook is a great way to network as well. I meet a lot of people that I've met at our march via Facebook. Social media is a great tool. We're in a world where everything is digital nowadays. And so why not take advantage of the opportunities that we have on our at the palm of our hands? We have the internet. The internet is the most amazing thing that you can ever have in the entire world because you can find an answer in 0.5 seconds, right? So get on Facebook, um, go on the search engine, type in Frederick's March for Justice, type in Surge, type in I Believe in Me, type in the soup kitchen in downtown Frederick. There are multiple ways and different avenues for you to get involved. I would also tell you that um, you can also get involved um, by, uh, oh, lost my train of thought. I'm going to skip that point because I completely lost my train of thought. But um, when you're getting involved, also remember that you don't have to have this mindset where you think that, you know, going in, you're not going to be the most confident person. I feel like that's kind of unrealistic to ask of people. Going in, you're going to be anxious. You're going to be nervous. Do I really want to do that? You know what I mean? I think everyone overall has this long list of things that they want to achieve by the end of the year, right? Realistically, knock off some of those and look at two of them and find a way to really gear yourself in for those two different things. So whether that's activism or volunteerism or coaching, there are ways, there are people that you can meet to direct you in the way that you need to be directed so that you can become successful within Frederick locally, statewide. I know Cavante knows people statewide. If you're looking to be, you know, you, you know, take his path, you, he knows people statewide. I know a lot of people locally in Frederick and so does Akia. And I think they can back me on that as well. Reach out to us, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people. Please, please, please network. It's the most, um, take advantage of it is what I'm trying to say. Take advantage of the opportunities that FCC presents you virtually and in person because I know there are some uh, events virtually. So if you are listening, this is networking. If you're listening right now, you are networking. Take, I'm glad that you took the time to take advantage of this. Um, and yeah, that's what I could tell people if they, if they were asking about how to become involved, network, get on social media, do it that way. Elijah, can I ask you one more question that's not related to this? This is a little off the cuff, but mm -hmm. I'm just so curious. You work at Hillcrest Elementary School, right? Yes. Can you tell us just briefly um, what you see in your little people? Oh man. Right, in terms of like the seeds that you see of what they, like what's possible, right? Like what do you see in little people that can be nurtured and um, yeah. yeah. So I work as a behavioral specialist at Hillcrest. Um, I never saw myself working with children ever, um, but it was an opportunity that I'm taking advantage of because listen, an opportunity is an opportunity. You never know where it's going to lead you, right? And so the opportunity I was presented to plant this seed in these little people, it is the most amazing thing that I've ever done in my life. Seeing them um, face to face, because there are students, some students come into the school face to face, hearing their cries, okay? Um, I'm talking pre-K up to fifth grade. You know, there are students who genuinely don't know how to communicate their their feelings, right? And so I took it upon myself to start, you know, some different organizations at Hillcrest in order to give these pre-K students, these kindergartners, a platform to speak. And whether or not that's getting on Zoom and them telling me what they watched on TV, and they will go on for 30 minutes about how the cat did this, and this is why the cat was wrong, because the dog... And it's beautiful, right? Because it, like you said earlier, everything isn't political. There's meaning to every single thing that we do. And that goes all the way down to my pre-K students. There was a student actually um, who came to me one-on-one um, -on -one and shared how upset he was that his father um, is unable to live in the United States. And it took me, I mean, I stepped away um, from, from him because I just became emotional um, because it's just the simple fact that the state of our world is at a point in time where we were once taking families, we were separating families, right? And so hearing that from a second grader that doesn't know how to communicate but can tell me I haven't seen my dad in two years and how that affects them 
that literally encourages me and makes and builds me. It literally, I go home and I tell myself, I have to continue doing what I'm doing because if I don't, they will look at me and ask me, why did you stop? And I can't have that. I can't, I can't, I won't go to sleep at night with that on my mind. And there are, to think that there's multiple children thinking the same way, we have to learn to give our kiddos, the babies, the middle schoolers and the high schoolers, the space and the environment, right? To fail, right? Because we all are gonna fail. I mean, I used to be very picky when they come into my office, don't throw Play-Doh there, don't throw Play-Doh. Listen, if one time the little boy was creating Play-Doh and he was drawing a picture of his home and his home life, and that was art for him, right? He was telling me a story through the Play-Doh. So I was, even though to me, it would look like he was making a mess, he was telling me something, how he genuinely felt. And I took that and I'm like, okay, these kids, they need a platform. I'm gonna give them the microphone. I'm going to give them the mic and let them talk about whatever they want to talk about. And when they get to middle school, I want to hopefully, I want to hope that there are organizations and platforms put into place that allow middle schoolers to speak in comfortable environments where they're not told you can't do this or you are wrong. We need more people volunteering for uh, elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. And I just want to throw that out there. I know right now for COVID, it's very difficult, but post COVID, fingers crossed. Um, we try to become in, involved with uh, the, the next generation, the babies. They, they need us. They're our future. And in order to, as I always say, in order to enact that change, we have to affect them first because they're the ones that are going to be running for office, right? They're the ones that if we, if we fill their minds with hope and joy, that gives them the opportunity to literally say, I can do it. And they won't sit there as a, as a, as a 21 year old, like I was contemplating small things and not taking advantage of opportunities because I was afraid or because I was shushed or because I was told you can't do that. So back to your point, yes, um, being in an elementary school, it is an honor. It is a privilege to be able to work with that generation. And I hope and pray that within the future, we can create some sort of environment where they feel safe and they feel comfortable enough to speak about wrong and right. Thank you. I, you know, I, I just think it's really important for us to understand that activism can happen in a lot of places. You, it doesn't have to be marching, right? Like it can be teaching, it can be serving, it can be, there's a, basically think of what you like to do and there's a way to be an activist in that place, right? to speak up. And so Elijah, I mean, my heart's in education too, as you know. So um, I just am really heartened to hear that you're working with our little people and, and lighting that fire. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we're gonna turn it to some question and answer, um, like an opportunity for our audience to ask some questions. And um, I'll see if there's anything, I am not looking at the chat. So I will see if um, Miss Jeannie, are there any questions? I'll give everybody, actually, let me do this. Let me give everybody an opportunity to put some questions in the chat if they have any. And while we're doing that, I will give either Kavante or Akia an opportunity to answer that question about what would you say to fellow students or other people that you know about how to get, how to get involved. And then we'll, we'll take a look back at the chat. I'll say, um that I hear a lot of people saying the word political. And that is a conversation that I think we need to have more. That the work that, that we do with Frederick March for Justice isn't, we, it's not a political party. And I think within this last um, election, we've heard a lot Democrat and Republican it's taken some strength to <laughs> combat that because we wanted to get as far away from that conversation as possible for everyone, uh, Kavante, Elijah, um, myself, we were a part of Frederick turning blue. Kavante, you have the dates. I remember when you posted it. I can't remember the years right now because I did not have that fun fact written down, but Frederick turned blue. It, it, it wasn't just about 
we didn't go out there to make it turn blue. We didn't go out there to say vote Democrat, but we did go out there stressing the importance of voting, being registered to vote. So whichever way it was gonna go, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that we did make an impact, but we didn't go out there specifically saying this is political. This is why it takes supporting organizations such as what um, Frederick March for Justice is and individuals such as Cavante, because as we support and advocate, we want to get people in positions within our government that align with our values. That's where political comes in. That's where working together and collaborating with um, young people um, such as Cavante that ran for council and hopefully will run for other places in office that is where it becomes political and we can enact change within our government systems. But it's not always a direct hit politically. We wanna be able to enact change within the school systems. That's not necessarily political. So social and uh, racial justice does not always just happen within political parties or elections. We can impact those to be able to change the legislation and the laws that govern us, but it's not always political. And I think some people will say, cause I've heard it a couple of times, I'm not political, I'm not, I'm not either. That's why I'm not, I'm tiptoeing around it cause I don't wanna say the wrong thing, but I know that I do stand for justice. I do know when I see something wrong in our community and I do see areas where change is necessary that I have a voice and I wanna speak up for it. So for anyone that feels like they're not political, I will also second that with you and say, I'm not political either, but I do see the importance in our uh, political system, but there's so many other places that, that we need reform and change in um, our legal system our educational system, our healthcare system, housing market, all of these, there is not a system or institution within our country that does not have discrimination or racism deeply embedded in it. And that, that has negative outcomes for people that look like me, minorities, um, those in our community. So it find your passion is what I will say, find your interest and then align your passion and your interest to organizations that support that. That's where you're gonna get, um, that's where you're gonna make the biggest impact. If you're passionate about something, align yourself with organizations that support those things that you're passionate about. And I'll stop there. Great advice. Yeah, I really, um, I'm writing some of those things down over here. <laughs> Thank you. Akia, we do have a question in the, um, in the chat here. Actually, it was in the Q&A, which is why I didn't see it. Um, and the question is from Sarah. She asks, what suggestions do you have for dealing with people in our lives, friends, relatives, neighbors, community members, or et cetera, who completely disagree with social justice protests, work uh, slash work, or they feel that nothing's wrong, it needs to change? had this conversation before, I think with the county exec. Um, we as a team have that tough conversation because it does impact you emotionally when you see something wrong and someone else says there's nothing, there's no racism. We have a sheriff that says there's no systemic racism. It, it, it becomes irritating. It can infuriate you. You, you have to then step away. Emotional health, mental health is very important. And during a time where COVID and we're isolated is at all time high, I will say every fight is not your fight. Every heart and mind is not yours to change. Knowing when to engage a person and knowing when to disengage will definitely be the impact and the strength that you need to continue on this journey. You can take yourself out of the fight just by continuing to fight the wrong people. Um, I tend to not go to too many counter protests anymore because I'm exuding too much energy and strength with people that are deeply, deeply uh, moved by their value and their belief. I'm not going to make the impact where I'm going to make the impact is out in the areas of talking to the young people, like Elijah said, that are impacted uh, by uh, not having food or financial uh, disparities, those things. 
I, I want to align myself and be able to read, engage those that I encounter. If your neighbor has a sign out or you know that their values don't align, it is, it's just like water and grass. If you have that conversation and you know that there's no growth here, why continue to go back and fight someone that is deeply in, like they have to change. I think sometimes we're trying to force things on people and it's just like raising kids for anybody that's out there raising kids. The second you tell a kid to do something or not to do something, the more they want to do it, the more you want to double down. So I encourage people to have wisdom in the people that they engage with. And if you get a sense that this is a losing battle, the battle is not ours. We, we can win it incrementally by changing overall, making the biggest impact to a majority, not, not just this one person. I'm not here to just win the one. Um, so move on if you feel like th this is not a winning a, a person that you can win this battle with because the battles are not won with individuals. We win it by changing systems, by changing hearts and minds that are ready to be changed. And if I can add, um, uh, you know, I would just say don't lose hope. Um, the, the reality of the situation is, uh, Kia touched on it, we're, there's no way we're going to win everybody over. Um, even with Frederick County turning blue, trust you me, we got a, a city election coming up and a county election coming up, and we're going to fight to keep Frederick County blue. Um, some of that change only happened because who the previous president was. So, I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. Um, but do not lose hope. I, I, I talked to friends, especially um, uh, friends who are Caucasian and, you know, they battle, they have, they're, they're, they're fighting a war pretty much, um, with, with, because they side with the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement, yet their, their, their families do not. And then, so there's, there, there's this breakdown because, you know, we can't, we can't see eye to eye, but the reality of it is, um, again, not losing hope, continuing to do, continue doing what you know that you are called to do or what you are supposed to do. And the reality of it is that prayerfully, if, if you keep living right and you keep walking right, they're going to follow behind you. And that's just, that's just how I keep um, uh, pushing forward. Um, again, we will never, ever, ever win everyone over. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Akia mentioned it, so I'll bring it up. Uh, Sheriff Chuck, Chuck Jenkins has been a uh, sitting sheriff for 15 years now. Um, you know, I, I have conversations all the time. Uh, I do believe that he's unfit to serve as sheriff of Frederick County. I've made that uh, position multiple times, and so I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. And yet I continue to get pushback um, from even people in my own race. You know, it is what it is. But it's the reality that Chuck is one of those good old boys here in Frederick, and, and he's been in Frederick forever. He attended high school here. Everybody knows his family. He knows everybody's family. But at the same time, if we look at the, the, the policies and, and the things that he's implemented into the sheriff's office, it's not benefiting any community but his own. And so we really have to examine those things and, and be willing to have those tough conversations. Yes, I do think that sometimes we need to uh, walk away and, and ignore. Um, but again, I think if we continue to keep pushing forward uh, with, with our end goal in mind, you know, we'll, we'll see a better result in, in our community. Thank you. Um, this has been just absolutely amazing. There are actually other questions in the chat and in the Q&A that we're not going to have time to get to tonight um, because we only have these three lovely folks on the hook for an hour um, and we are approaching eight o'clock. So what we can do, though, is we can take those questions um, and uh, we can put I'll be happy to put my email in the chat. If you want to email them to me, uh, we'll see if we can get an, an answer to you from our from our panelists to whom they've been directed. So um, I just want to thank you for for being here. But I am going to turn it over to Shelby for the final closeout here. Thank you all so much. Wow, thank you. I've learned so much from all of you, and I just love all of you. Okay. In closing, I would like to thank our audience, our panelists, my co-facilitators, and I also would like to thank the ones behind the scenes. And that's Jeannie winston Mirror. She's the director of the Center for Student Engagement at Frederick Community College. Christy Mills 
Assistant Director for Center for Student Engagement at Frederick Community College. Jen Moxley, Coordinator of Le Student Leadership and Service Learning, Center for Student Engagement at Frederick Community College. And the, co co I'm sorry, the curriculum planning team. So with that, I'd like to say, have a wonderful evening. And I'd just like to leave you with this thought from John Dickerson. United we stand, divided we fall. Thank you all.